Well, good morning, everybody. Lovely to welcome you to Crawley Baptist's morning service on the 29th of March 2020. Well, you might notice it's a little bit different because I'd like to welcome you into the dining room of the Mance this morning. That's where we are. And uh, we're also going to be in Marion and Richard's home a little bit later, but they'll say hello from there when we get to that point in our service. But you're all very welcome. I really hope this morning that you are well and that you are going to be able to join in with us. The words of the songs will appear on the screen when we get to them a bit later. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to sing along and uh, maybe even encourage your neighbours to do the same. I, I just want to say a couple of words of thanks at the start of this service. I want, particularly want to say thank you to everybody who made last week's service such a great event. Lisa and I have tried to we were watching it on our phone um, in Wales, and it was great. So thank you to everybody who made that happen. Obviously, we couldn't make it happen like that this week with all the changes that have been put in place. But thank you to everybody who took part last week. I want to thank those people who you probably can't see. Well, you can't see. I can see some of them, but you can't see any of them who are making it work this week. I'd like to thank Justin, who's done an amazing amount of work behind the scenes, getting all the technology working. Megan, who is telling me when I can speak and when I should be silent, and she's waving at me now. And I'd like to thank Ben, who um, is watching this and he's been part of the group and is monitoring everything that's going on. Richard Stroud for his wise advice. And of course, for Richard and Marion, who you'll see later. You might be wondering why I this morning I've got my tie on. It's different actually, all you can't see it, is my slippers. I do have my slippers on, which I wouldn't have if I was in the church. The reason I'm doing that is because I want it to be as normal as possible and I dress like this for church because I think it's something really important. So I'm doing something important again today, even though I'm sitting in my dining room. So I've dressed up I, I and I hope that is helpful to you. Um, now then, guess what? I have some notices for you. Hooray! You can't get away from it, even on the live stream. But these are important things. Just a couple of things I want you to know about in case you haven't yet figured it out. So if you go onto our website, there's the blue bar on the top, then you can connect to a couple of newsletters that I've written over the last couple of weeks. And I'm going to be doing that regularly. So towards the end of the week, each week, I'm going to put up another newsletter. And if you would like to access that, you can do. I know Sandra is going to be sending some out as well, so you might get one that way. And I made Colin Guest's uh, year last evening when I sent him an email saying, can he reinstate the blog on the website? Colin has been for 10 years trying to get me to write a blog, and it, and now I've decided maybe I should try. So, I'm going to try, so there'll be a blog, and I'm guessing I'm going to try and do that every day, although right at this moment, I'm going to have to be reminded how to make it work, but it is going to happen, so I hope that's going to be helpful. This evening, the Baptist Union, I think along with lots of other churches, are having a, a web meeting uh, online, which we are invited to join in. Go on to the link to the live stream for that service this evening. And interestingly, they've picked the same chapter in Jeremiah that we're going to be looking at this morning, although a slightly different verse. So you can access that. That's at 7 o'clock if you want to join with people from across the nation. And then finally to say that there's been a group of us who've been meeting online to pray every morning at half past seven. We're doing it via Zoom. You would be very welcome to join in. It only lasts half an hour because you're only allowed half an hour. Um, and if you'd like to do that, I, I'm hoping Graham Piper's watching. Obviously, I can't see him. Morning, Graham and Philippa again. But if you'd like to be part of that, just Graham Piper and then he'll be able to send you the link. And you'd be very welcome half past seven to about eight o'clock every morning. Well, that's the notices over. Uh, never thought we'd have them online, did you? There we go. Well, it really is great to be together this morning, and we, we are going to have some worship in song now, and uh, Marion and Richard can lead us as we do that. Well, thank you for inviting us into your home. You are very welcome in ours, too. We as God's scattered family, to gather together in worship this morning. So let's pause, let's be still, and let's welcome God's Holy Spirit into our homes. Breathe deeply, breathe in the presence of God. Psalm 46, God says, 
Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He is the king of all kings. He wears the victor's crown. Let's crown him as we worship. Take a moment now to enthrone him in our lives. Rule in our thinking, rule in our speaking, rule in our relationships, our homes, and Lord, in amongst all the fear, that you may 
peace would rule in our hearts. Jesus, thank you that you're not a king who's far off. You're not untouchable, but you invite us right in to your throne room. Oh, Lord Jesus, you are the king who says to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lord Jesus, you're the king who says, let the little children come to me. Lord Jesus, you, you are the king who says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Lord, there's no other fountain to drink from. There's no other refuge or mountain that I want to run to. So we run to you, Lord. Let the Never 
Lord God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the truth that we have just sung together. And Lord, we pray for Ian now, that he would know your blessing and your anointing as he brings your word, your word into our lives today. Amen. Well, great to be able to worship together this morning and uh, as we come into God's presence in all the places that we are. Just before we get into the talk for this morning, I think I might be right in saying, I hope I'm right in saying, that some of your families might have had something from Denise this week. Uh, Denise watching. Hi, Denise, if you're out there. And uh, it might be something you've already done, but it might be something you could do now at this point in the service. And that's something we're going to try and keep going for all the time we're doing this. Well, if you're regularly part of Crawford Baptist Church, then you'll know we've been in a series in Jeremiah, and we're going to continue that series today. I did wonder a little bit at one point whether I should change what I was going to say in the light of what's happening, but Scripture has a way of being uncannily relevant. I wrote a particular talk two weeks ago, tomorrow actually, because we were going to be going away, and I'm going to preach it almost exactly as I wrote it. And I hope you'll understand that that was exciting for me when I came back to look at it and how relevant it seems today. So if you have your Bibles ready, you might want to turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. I'm going to get there in just a little bit. It's probably one of the best known verses in the Bible. And of course it is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. When we moved into, and when I wrote these words, I wrote this particular church building. Well, it's the church building just up the road today, as it turns out, isn't it? But when we built what we called the new church building then, we named a room after this verse. We had a room in the building named the 2911 room. While we were um, building, we had a team named after this verse, the 2911 team. It's a verse with a promise. That's why we chose it. It's a verse with a promise. That's why we love it. I'm wondering why else we might love this particular verse, because lots of us do. Here's what I think. I think we love it because we like it to mean that things will work out for us. And by that, I mean mostly things will work out how I would like. And by that, maybe we mean that because God is for us, things will go well with us and for us. And we love it because actually that makes it all about me. God is going to be good to me in ways that I understand good to be. Make no mistake, friends, Jeremiah 2011 is a fantastic verse given by a fantastic God. But I'm wondering if there might be a better way of understanding this verse than the way I have just described so this morning I'm going to share my conviction, as it is at this moment, around this verse. Now, of course, you don't have to agree with me, but here is, I think, a better but possibly more challenging way of understanding what we read in this particular verse and how to apply it. What seems to me also really important is that we understand the context into which these words were spoken. So I'm going to read Jeremiah chapter 29. I'm going to read the first 14 verses, and I'm reading from the New International Version. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests and prophets and all the other people who could never carry the exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the Queen Mother, the court officials and the leader of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elasa, son of Shaphan, and to Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. 
Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them to you, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord said. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to you and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring back and bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This letter was written to people in exile. In 598 BC, the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem and took King Jehoiakim, the queen mother, and the most of the leaders to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar came back in 587 BC and then destroyed what was left of Jerusalem. Zedekiah was left in Jerusalem, the puppet king, after the exile. Jeremiah, though, was left in Jerusalem, probably because he wasn't considered important enough to take to Babylon. Jeremiah writes this letter to the exiles in Babylon around 594 BC, so he writes it between the first and the second exiles of Jerusalem. Jeremiah is writing this letter to those who are already in exile. I wonder what it means to be in exile. Here's a thought. Some of us actually already know what it's like to live in exile. Truth is, many of us are living there now. It's over that now say, actually, I was living there now. You'll see why I say that in a moment. Might think seem a strange thing to say, but let's see. Those in exile have been uprooted from the place they were born, the land they had been promised, and the land in which they now lived. They were forcibly removed, 700 miles across the desert, leaving behind everything they knew and loved. They found themselves in a whole new landscape, both physically and metaphorically. Everything was different, from the geography to the culture, from the weather to the rituals and the landmarks. And the exile experienced by Israel was both violent and traumatic. But the truth is, often throughout life, we have the experience of exile. We all experience changes in life that take us either literally or metaphorically to unfamiliar territory. Think about some of those experiences of life, for example. Think about these. Starting school, changing school, leaving home, starting a job, changing a job, moving house, getting married, getting divorced, getting older, retiring, a significant illness. Changes in society might feel like exile too. The change of a government, the change in values. And we are right now, aren't we, living in unfamiliar territory with the consequences of this coronavirus. This is unfamiliar territory, isn't it? Exile is circumstances where we are not at home. Which, when I wrote that yesterday, when I was writing up my notes, seemed an odd thing to say. From home. But it's not our normal home on a Sunday, is it? We are not at home, even though we are physically at home this morning. I'm wondering then, maybe some of my 
our experience right now in other ways than just what we're forced into with this coronavirus. We might too recognize the truth of exile in our past, times when we felt we were not at home. Perhaps exile is sometimes planned. It's, it's actually part of growing up. Perhaps, though, more devastatingly, it comes without warning. In Israel, it was violent and traumatic. Perhaps, in truth, some of us know what that's like, too, the loss of a loved one, the diagnosis of an illness, the loss of a job, and where many, many people today find themselves in that place. Perhaps really the essential meaning of exile is that we find ourselves in a place we do not want to be. Exile is the place where everything is out of sync, the rhythm of life has vanished, we have lost the familiar which has been replaced by the unfamiliar. Exile perhaps teaches us that the world is not stable and stable and many of us are finding that challenge to be very difficult, aren't we? But it is also true, perhaps, that exile can become the place of opportunity. Israel was in exile because it refused to accept God's invitation to live his best for them. Now they find themselves in Babylon, a place they do not want to be. They are now faced with a choice, and the question is, what will they do? They could wallow in self-pity. Understandably, they longed to be in Jerusalem. In Babylon, everything is different. The food, the culture, the worship, the landscape, the clothes, the people, the language, the accents, the morality, the daily way of life. And it would be easy to complain. It would be easy to dream of another world, the one they really wanted to inhabit. And there was a problem. There were false prophets. There were prophets among them telling them they would be home soon. The trouble is that only served their self-pity. This is a nightmare, but we will be home soon. And here's the challenge. If there was a good chance that they would get back all they had lost, there was no need to live well in exile. The temptation for us is to do the same. When we find ourselves in exile, when we are living in a place we do not want to live, we too can wallow in self-pity, dream of another world, and refuse to live well in the present. So, in these days, friends, how are you doing? When life plunges us into the place we do not want to be, when circumstances change and life is very different, when we have lost what we once held dear, how do we choose to respond? Well, how are you responding right now to this unfamiliar territory brought out by the coronavirus? Jeremiah writes a letter to the exiles with a very different message to the prophets. His message from God is the very opposite of the one given by the false prophets. On the contrary, he says, their exile will last some time. God tells his people, build houses and live in them. Make yourselves a home. You may not want to be here, but you'll be here a good while. So build well. Your life here is valuable too. Really important thought. Your life here and now is valuable too. God tells his people, plant gardens, eat the produce, enter the rhythm of the seasons, be a productive part of the, of the economy, embrace what you can learn. God tells his people, get married. That's a challenge for us right now, isn't it? Because we can't do that. But he says, get married, have families. It's the foundation of community. And God loves these people too. These people may appear different. You cannot be the people God wants you to be if you stand aloof from them. God tells his people, 
Seek the welfare of the city. Don't fight it. Engage with it. You can be agents of change. Those who bring shalom to the city. Shalom is an all-encompassing thought and implies a city surging with life-transforming love. Exile forces a decision. How do we live? I'm reading a book at the moment to help me with my work that I do as a counsellor at St Catherine's Hospice. It's a book called Finding Meaning, and it's written for those who are experiencing grief after the loss of a loved one. That too is an exile, a place we do not want to be. I read something I found really challenging, challenging for those I have the privilege of sitting with, but also challenging for me. Writing about the grief experienced after the death of a loved one, the author writes this, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. He's writing in the context of grief, but I'm wondering if that might not be true about living in exile too. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. And I'm wondering if that was the choice that Israel had in Babylon. Do we live in self-pity or do we live at our best even in the place that we do not want to be? Perhaps another way of saying that is this question. Will we live on the basis of what we don't have or on what we do have? So how are you doing, friends, in these days? It is into this context of exile that Jeremiah speaks words of invitation and promise found in Jeremiah 29.11. These words were the words that shaped the experience of the people of Israel in exile. Now, this is my opinion, but it seems to me we tend to view the words of Jeremiah 29.11 to be about a desired future. You know, God will make it better with a wave of his hand, and I will flourish. But what if the promise and invitation are for now? The people of Israel accepted Jeremiah's message and settled down to figure out what it meant to be God's people in exile. They chose to live well in the place they did not want to be, Babylon. Eugene Peterson, in his commentary on this part of Jeremiah, argues that this was, in fact, the most creative part of the history of the Hebrew people. He argues that far from losing their identity in exile, they actually discovered it. They lived in ways that reflected their status as the people of God. And they discovered that God was as present in exile as he ever was in Jerusalem. The truth, it seems to me, is that in the crucible of exile, the people of Israel found God. They found in exile, they didn't simply exist, they were able to live an abundant life. And living every day at their best in exile the people of God were participating in God's future for them. So my conviction is that Jeremiah 29, 11 is less about a fantastical future where everything will be great and I will have what I want. It is much more about living God's best in the present and living God's future in the everyday. God's desire was never for the people of Israel to experience a violent and traumatic exile. That was never part of the plan. But he showed that he was with them and as close to them in exile as much as he was with them and close to them in Jerusalem. So a challenging truth might be this. Sometimes exile will live most closely with God and live 
at our best. Jeremiah 29 11 is a promise not given to an individual, but to all the people of God. It is the promise that as followers of God, we live in his far bigger and far better story. It is for the future. It is the promise that one night hour, he will come for me. One bright hour, he will set this captive free. One bright hour, he will wipe the tears from my eyes now and see. And when that day comes, friends, I will sing hallelujah. And so I will sing it in the multitude of the heavenly hosts. Brothers and sisters, we will sing it together. We will sing it with all God's people. And what a day, what a day that will be. But from here to the finishing line, maybe in the crucible of exile, as we are now experiencing it in these days, how is it going to be, friends? To hold on to. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Now that, it seems to me, is worth living for. Amen. We're going to sing a song about the goodness of God. In days of uncertainty, when things are changing, it's good to hold on to the unchanging character of God. God is good. Let's hold on in the goodness of what is taught us in the light. God is good, and even though this song is a harp one to sing right now, let's sing it as a statement of faith. In this song we are expecting, we will know God's goodness. It's running. 
We're going to pray together now. So I'm going to lead us in some. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful. And lift up all those who are brought low. That we may rejoice in your comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We pray today for all those affected by the coronavirus through illness, isolation, anxiety, that they may find relief and recovery. Lord, hear us. We pray today for those who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping our national policies, that they may make wise decisions. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray today for the health and well-being of our nation, that we may know your peace in this challenging time. Lord, hear us. We pray today for those isolated and housebound, that we may be alert to their needs and care for them in their vulnerability. Lord, hear us. Father, we pray for our homes and our families, those still attending school, and our young people, and all in any kind of need or distress. Lord, hear us. Father, we pray for a blessing on our local communities that our neighbourhoods may be places of trust and friendship where all are known and cared for. Lord, we pray today, Father, for doctors, nurses and all those working in our health system, for our medical researchers, that you would be safe and well that you would give them the strength, perseverance and resilience they need, and that through their skills and insights, many will be restored to health. Lord, hear us. And Father, today we pray for our brothers and sisters across the world. We were privileged to join with me in prayer on Friday. He was able to join us over Zoom. And he was talking about the challenges they face in Romania. So, Father, we lift Deo Gloria, Emmy, Fabi, Heidi, Mircea, and all those we know in Hanukkah. And all those people in that nation, that you would help them and strengthen them at this time. We pray for Mark and Susanna Barrow and the family, some in Mozambique, some scattered in other places. But, Father, we pray that they would know your divine presence with them at this time, especially as they are separated. Father, we lift before you those things we see on the news which cause us to be distressed about how things are going in some parts of the world. And Father, we ask 
that as you have the whole world in your hands, you would be merciful and gracious and that you would help us at this difficult time. Father, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of our loving Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Death has now been 
Lord, in the watching and the waiting, help us to keep our eyes on you. You are the author and the perfecter of our faith. Help us to keep our eyes on you. And now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, that comes up to the end of our service this morning. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you again to those who are behind the scenes who've made this all possible. I hope it's been helpful to gather together this morning. And um, I wish you every blessing for this coming week and encourage us all to live well in this exile. Now, what would normally happen at the end of the service is we'd go out into the Rainbow Lounge and we would gather for coffee and a biscuit. Well, I had a message for girls this morning because they're on coffee this morning. You might not know that, but they are. And um, they want to say hello to you and they want to encourage you because they can't provide you with coffee today. But why don't you go have a coffee and a biscuit? And when you do that, why don't you phone someone and try and encourage them so that they can be encouraged for this coming week. Keep in touch with the website, keep looking at the newsletters, maybe the miracle of a blog will appear. Keep, in touch with that. keep texting each other, WhatsApping each other, Zooming each other, messaging, teaming each other, or however else you're doing it. Let's stay connected and let's live well in this exile. God bless you and we will see you at the same time, maybe from the same places, maybe from different places next week, but God bless you this week.